Hey everyone, today we'll be talking about authorization, which is the concept of defining access rights in digital systems. Unlike authentication, which verifies who you are, authorization determines what you can do. So what we'll be covering today, first we'll discover the differences between authentication and authorization, then we'll delve into brief definitions of what RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC are. After that, we'll do another comparison with coarse versus fine-grained authorization with RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC in mind. After that, we'll look at a API endpoint that returns a post from a database, and we'll look at how it looks unprotected, and then with RBAC, ABAC, or RBAC added, and, and specifically look at the code and compare how the implementation differs. The last thing we'll look into is how combining RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC can actually give you the best of both worlds. First, what's the difference between authentication and authorization? Essentially, authentication is the process of verifying a person's identity, while authorization is the process of managing what this identity has access to. So an example would be, let's say we're an airline boarding passengers. An individual walks up claiming to be Alex. Authentication would be the process of us verifying that this person is actually Alex. Maybe verifying via passport or a driver's license, matching that to how the person actually looks in real life. Authorization would happen after you verify this identity, checking whether Alex can sit in first class or not. So that's kind of the difference between authentication and authorization. When it comes to implementing authorization, there are a couple different models, each with their own approaches. ABAC, or attribute-based access control, uses user attributes, like user age or location. So you can be like, only users in Europe can access this content, only users in America can access this, or anything else, maybe document expiration time or something, just attributes of resources within the system. RBAC, or relationship-based access control, considers relationships between entities. So you can think of like manager employee, hierarchies, or folder subfolder systems. It's all based around the, the way that resources and users are connected. On the other hand, role-based access control, or RBAC, assigns permission based on roles, such as administrator or user or editor or owner, or whatever it is. You can think of each of these authorization models in terms of increasing levels of specificity with attributes being more broad access checks and roles being very specific, but specific implementation, of course, will vary. At the end of the day, it's a combination of models that will likely be the best fit, but it, it really depends on the application. So now moving into coarse versus fine grain authorization, when we think about the different models, RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC that we just discussed, so when we think about the different models that we just discussed, it can be really good to first consider how thinly grained our authorization model needs to be for an application. For basic consumer apps, there often only needs to be a very broad set of authorization checks. Maybe the application simply needs to verify that the user is an owner of some document, some content, and sharing is not a feature, or it's very straightforward. More complex systems where you have nested document and folder structures or hierarchical relationships between different entities, or you have very specific sharing mechanisms, you likely need more fine-grained permissions. In general, RBAC is used for more of the coarse grain authorization models, while ABAC and RBAC result in more fine grained ones. But at the end of the day, it's, it's usually a combination of these different models. Now we delve into an example, an API that returns a post. Maybe this is a social media app or something, but basically that's not important. What's important is that you can kind of see here, it gets the ID from the um, APR URL that's, that's being sent, and then you use the ID to get a particular post from the database, and then you return that post. And there's no validation here. It's just returning whatever document, whatever post that you request based on the ID. So we'll look at protecting that with RBAC. So with RBAC, you can see that it's all the same code, except 
we add this check. We get the user and then we check what role they have. And here we specify they have to be a admin or an owner in order to see the post. So that's yeah, just viewing a post. Let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons. So basically, our back really makes it simple to manage authorization, centralizing permissions through roles. It makes it really easy to assign and manage access to understand. It's very straightforward. And it actually adapts pretty well to different organizational sizes and structures. And is because of its simplicity and understanding, it's, it's pretty straightforward to audit. And you can see exactly what's, what's happening if they have a certain role. You can see what the roles are, what permissions are included in the roles. But one of the limits of RBAC is its flexibility for complex and dynamic environments. It's a little bit more difficult to get granular control with RBAC. Another challenge is role explosion, where in larger organizations where you're managing a vast number of roles, it can become really cumbersome and inefficient, where you have to manually implement like a, a ton of different checks for each resource because of, of this explosion in different roles. Lastly, it doesn't consider context of the situation. It doesn't consider, you know, a user's time or location, and, and this can be pretty crucial in a lot of situations. While RBAC offers simplified management, scalability, and ease of auditing, it also presents challenges in flexibility, role management, and context sensitivity. It's important to weigh these different factors when you're considering RBAC for your organization. So now moving on to ABAC. You can see here the same endpoint that's returning a post, but after that, you check for the post attributes. Is it public? You check the environment's attributes. Is the current time in the, the user's environment before the expiration date? So you can see how this allows you to leverage the context of the situation to define whether or not a user is able to access a post. So moving on to more of the pros and cons of ABAC, you look at high granularity as a pretty significant pro enabling detailed and nuanced access control because policies can be tailored based on various user and resource attributes. And this also means that there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to dynamic environments where access requirements are frequently changing and there's a lot of adaptability that other models might not give you. So at the end of the day, it's very policy driven. You have the ability to enforce broad or very specific policies using a diverse set of attributes. So despite some performance overheads around traversing data when you make access decisions, it's generally pretty efficient for querying. So pretty beneficial for large scale systems. So specific challenges for ABAC include complex policy management. What this means is that where you have a multitude of attributes and intricate policies, it can be pretty cumbersome to manage. So this also leads into the next thing where implementation is a little more complex. There's a lot of different um, systems that you could set up with ABAC and, and a ton of different attributes for different resources and users. So compared to RBAC, it ends up being a little bit more difficult. There's a bit of a performance overhead because you have to do more data traversals. And, and that's more complex in our back. And finally, auditing can be a little more challenging due to the intricacy of ABAC policies. ABAC offers high granularity, flexibility, and policy-driven control. But on the other hand, it's, it's a, a little more challenging in policy management, implementation complexity, performance, and auditing. So yeah, you should consider all, all these different options. So moving on to relationship-based access control or REBAC. Here we see that there's kind of the same post uh, being returned um, at the end. And you do the relationship uh, check before you actually do the data return. Um, so that's a little bit different from ABAC, but similar to RBAC. And what you do is you just pass in a resource that you're trying to access and the user's ID and then what permission they should have. So it's, it's relatively straightforward to handle a check here. It's, it's, it's just passing in basically um, three different parameters to, to define a particular relationship that you're checking for. Um, 
And then if they don't have that relationship, then you return unauthorized. So going into a bit of the pros and cons of Reback, one of its strengths is that it's really good for hierarchies, for nested permissions, uh, nested relationships, and hierarchical structures. It's, and that's a pretty common scenario for a lot of organizations. It also supports reverse indices pretty effectively because of its graph-like nature, um, which can be pretty important for certain really complex data environments. Um, lastly, uh, it's pretty flexible in its relationship mapping. So Reback is particularly well suited for these complex structures with intricate relationships so you have really nuanced access control and you get these dynamic permissions um, because you, you can have like really real-time updating of permissions as the relationships between entities changing um, which has a level of dynamism that's difficult to get in the other access control models but there's also significant challenges First and foremost, it's a little more complex than the other two to understand and implement to begin with. Um, there's there's a, a good amount more resources and expertise that you would need. Um, inefficient queries also can be an issue where the recursive nature of relationships in Reback can lead to less efficient querying, which could impact performance at large-scale systems. But this is generally manageable in a service, so not as much of an issue. Um, auditing is also another drawback. Because of the complexity of policies in Reback, auditing becomes more challenging, uh, potentially impacting compliance and sec security oversight. Uh, and, and lastly, there's just a bit more of a learning curve. Implementing and managing Reback requires a deeper understanding of um, the relationship dynamics, which might be a barrier for some teams. So at the end of the day, there's no one model that will suit every application's need. It's up to the developer to choose the right authorization model at the right time. So you can be begin with RBAC for a base level of access control and layer on ABAC to handle more nuanced access based on attributes. And then ReBAC can be used when relationships are really key to access decisions. So on top of choosing your model, um, you want to make sure that the model is consistent um, as overly complex policies can lead to misconfiguration and security loopholes. And thirdly, you'll want to maintain your authorization policy over time, making sure that it reflects your current needs and security requirements. So wrapping up for today, if you're looking at authentication, authorization, including RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC, or user management into your application, be sure to check out Dscope and sign up for a free forever account. In particular, if you're trying to set up fine-grained authorization, Dscope actually has a fine-grained authorization service that makes it really straightforward to add Reback or ABAC into your application. If you have any questions, be sure to check out Dscope's Authtown community at uh, dscope.com community. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks so much for listening.